I'm going to get started. Thank you guys all for showing up. Um, because it's a relatively small group, I will probably, like, if you guys have questions, feel free to, like, flag me down and uh, I'll go. Um, so this talk is going to be PHP at Google Scale. The idea is um, there are a whole number of ways of hosting PHP on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, I would like to talk about them. I'd like to show you that they're pretty, pretty cool to use. Um, my name is Terry Ryan. I'm a developer advocate for Google. Um, and with that, I'm going to ask who you guys are. Um, so I assume you guys are PHP developers, right? Okay. Um, are you guys doing any sort of operation stuff, any sort of DevOps stuff, or are you all developer? DevOps a little bit? Okay. Um, cool. And how many people here have heard of Docker? Have used Docker? Are comfortable with and like Docker? Okay, good. Less hands. All right, that's how that goes. All right, good. So that gives me a good grounding of what you guys know and what jokes I can make and all that sort of thing. So introduction. Um, so you want to make an app, right? So you take some code. Sorry, that was a little bit fast. You add some code. <laughs> you, throw, uh, you throw some processing power at it. Um, and hopefully, after a time, you need more processing power, right? That means your app is successful, people are using it, you need more resources. Now, there are a bunch of different ways of getting those resources. You can do it on-prem, you can do it with a traditional hosting environment, you can do it with a cloud host, um, like, you know, Amazon, or you can do it with uh, Google Cloud Platform. And my, my goal here is to at least make this, uh, make this an option for you guys. So, I work for Google. And when you think of Google, you think of this. Although our marketing team would prefer now in the future that you think of this, right? All right. So um, this is the. I don't work for search, so I can say good things about them. It doesn't make me look like I'm puffing us up. Search, the search team does awesome stuff. They've made Google Search the dial tone of the internet. And what I mean by that is, if you have people in your life that are not that technical, your parents uncles, aunts, siblings, friends, and when they talk about the Google, you know this is who I'm talking about, right? And when they go to the internet and they go to, go to Google, uh, to the Google, um, and they don't get there, they assume the internet is broken, right? Those of us that know, know it could be a whole bunch of things and quite possibly Google could be down, right? But the search team's job is to make sure that when people go to the Google and they don't get there, uh, it's because the internet is down and not because of them. And they do a really good job of it. They <clears throat> throw some numbers. Uh, we do over two and a half billion searches a day. Uh, we do that on a, uh, on a universe of 60 trillion URLs, 20 billion of which get updated every day. Uh, and we return all that in under 250 milliseconds. Right? So that's the sort of scale that we deal with at Google. And in order to do that, basically, it's we have this very minimal front end on lots and lots and lots and lots of infrastructure. Um, we grew five times. I'm sorry. In the first five months Google existed, we grew 10 times in five months. Um, and so the sort of scale issues you have when you grow that fast, you start to run out of sort of industry standard solutions. So a lot of our work around infrastructure and um, building up has been about dealing with scale very quickly. So one of the side effects of having a tremendous amount of infrastructure, more infrastructure than we know what to do with, is that when we have crazy ideas, we call moonshot ideas, uh, we don't ever worry about whether or not we can run them. Um, so take, for example, Gmail, right? We're going to give everybody, 10 years ago, we're going to give everybody a gig of mail when other providers are giving out a megs of mail, and we're going to do it for free. That's a crazy idea. And there are a lot of problems. There's privacy issues. There's um, whether or not people would go for it. Uh, but we never worried about the infrastructure. Same thing with maps. We're going to take a picture of every place. We're going to drive around in a van and take pictures of every, every place on Earth. Now, there are a lot of problems with that idea, right? <laughs> At least of which we're driving around in a van and taking pictures of everyone. And some governments, like, say, Germany, weren't really too, uh, too uh, fond of that. But whether or not we could handle it was never the issue. So we had this infrastructure to power our moonshots. Google Cloud Platform is our hope at powering your moonshots. Right? So um, we have a whole bunch of stuff. We have a computing tier, a storage tier, connectivity tier, big data tools. 
management and development tools, mobile tools, but I'm going to focus on this layer right here, the computing tools, right? Because, I mean, storage is storage, big data tools are big data, they have an API, you can use them for anything, but compute is where PHP becomes something that you need to concern yourself with and, and worry about. So, we like to think about this in a continuum, because a continuum is only slightly less sexy than a Venn diagram. And it's a continuum between uh, convenience and control. So on one end we have App Engine, the, uh, which is our platform as a service, which I'll talk about a little later. And then we have Compute Engine, which is our infrastructure as a service, which I'm going to talk about right now. So let's say you're one of the people who want to control all the things. You, you had parties, right, where you racked servers and ran all the wires and you ran them perfectly the way you wanted to. Anybody else that? Nerdy, then did that, yeah. So um, you want to control all the things. Then Compute Engine is really what you want to be talking about. So Compute Engine is our infrastructure as a service. We're talking about VMs here, SSH access, and you have multiple performance options. I'm not going to talk about it too much uh, other than to just show it off. So let's show off Compute Engine. Now I'm going to fire up a new instance, or I'm going to try to, if my mouse does not slide completely off the podium. All right. Go there. There we go. Uh, so I'm going to create a new instance. See, and I have a couple of options here. Uh, I'm going to give it a name. Uh, do it live. Spell it correctly. I have a number of options for where I can host this: U.S. East, U.S. Central, Europe, uh, and Asia. Uh, let's see. What else can I do? I can change the uh, configuration of what sizes I have here and go all the way from one CPU all the way to 32 and all the way up to 208 gigs of RAM. I'm just going to leave it the standard one here. Um, I have a number of disk options including uh, images that include Windows, um, Core OS, CentOS. I'm going to stick with the Debian one there and I'm just going to make the disk SSD because I like SSD. It's faster. And can you guys read the screen? I'm just, it's sort of all right, well, I'm talking through it, so I'm going to hopefully um, help. Uh, let's see. All right, now, one of the cool things here is that uh, before I can also add, like, startup scripts, and I can do a whole bunch of other options there, but one of the things I love is down here at the bottom, um, I can click command line and get the command line version of what I'm doing. So anything I do through the UI, I can then grab script and then do on, on MOS later. Close that, and I'll create that. Now, I'm creating it live. Um, and we like to say this takes tens of seconds, uh, meaning some time between 10 seconds and usually about 50. If I'm having a good day on a Saturday, probably be quicker, be about 20. Um, if it's a busy day, probably closer to 40. Um, and clearly I'm stalling because I want the machine to come up. And hopefully, yep, it's up. So we went towards the quick end of that. Now this is my favorite part of spinning up a machine is that I just click this button SSH and we get our SSH in a browser uh, session going. And what I love about this is no pulling down certs, no, uh, I mean I can if I want to, if I, if I have my own, like if, if I have my own terminal client that I'm really a big believer in, I can, I can do all that. But for the most part, if I just want to run, you know, the shell, whoa, that, that is really unlegible, I apologize. Um, let me, there. So, normal shell script, right? So I'm going to go apps, get update. I'm going to remember that I'm supposed to sudo that. So I'll do sudo uh, exclamation point, exclamation point. And then there we go. And so I can go through normally how I do my normal install, install all the stuff I want, um, and move on with it, right? So that, in a nutshell, I won't you know, belabor too much of that. You know how to run a box. Uh, let's see, I'll leave this page. I'm going to delete this because I can. And let me go back here and talk about some of the pros and cons of this. So pros, uh, it's a VM, right? So you can do whatever you want with it. You can figure out whatever you want. Um, scaling here is manual. If uh, you're in charge of you need more servers, you build more servers. Um, startup time in tens of seconds. 
and you have a lot of performance options, and you have the uh, SSH directly from the browser, which we like. Cons, management is on you, right? And that some people that's a pro, some people that's a con, right? You're going to update the OS, you're going to keep patching it. Um, anything that you expose is sort of on you, right? Like, it's a VM, right? You kind of know how that works. Scale is on you, and, and that we said was a pro and a con. Um, if you uh, start running in, into capacity issues, you can spin up more machines, but it's on you to do. We do have a tool, a couple tools that will help, and I'll talk about later. But for the most part, you're going to have to manage scale uh, for yourselves. So some people might say that that seems like a lot of work. And in that, like, so I got a VM, but now I got to start all the way from the beginning and build it up. Right. So we have something called Cloud Launcher that spawns prepackaged machines. There's two flavors of them. Click to deploy is our technology. Bitnami is a kind of cool uh, piece of technology, which they make images that go across, plat uh, go across cloud platforms. So if you pull down the Bitnami image for PHP, LAMP stack um, on Google Cloud Platform, it's going to be very similar, uh, pretty identical to the one that you pull down on Amazon to do the same thing. Uh, and that's, I'm just going to walk real quick through that and see some options here. Uh, here's Cloud Launcher. have a whole bunch of solutions. If I look up just straight PHP, I get the LAMP stack, the LAMP stack. I don't know why Ruby stack comes up. Um, it's probably because PHP is installed as part of it. Uh, I'll go with the Bitnami LAMP stack. And one of the cool things we do here is that we'll actually compute how much this is going to cost you. And you'll see that we've spelled out that uh, VM inserts, we go with the smallest one, is going to be $4 a month plus disk space comes up to $450 a month. And here, this particular image does not have a usage fee, but some of the commercial ones we have, like basically you pay us and we pay Nginx or Zend or a couple other companies that are doing that with us. So um, the, it's exactly the same procedure. I'm going to launch. Uh, let's see. I'll give it a here. And it's the same exact thing we did before. I'm not going to actually spin one up. Um, but you'll see here I can go through. I can change a whole bunch of stuff about it, rename it. Uh, I can't change the boot disk because it's unique to the, the image that I'm creating. But I can put it on SSD, change the size of the disk, do a whole bunch of things, and also get the command line to pull that one up. So that is Cloud Launcher. So that is the VM side of the house. Any questions about that before I move forward? No? All right. So say you are a devel developer and not a DevOpper, or however you would say that. Um, so you don't want to run systems. How many? I saw some DevOps hands, but do you guys really want to run systems, or do you run it because you have to? Have to. OK. Oh, some people really like running systems, right? Like, um, so. Our answer to that is App Engine. App Engine is a platform as a service, which means you give us code and we run it for you. You have no concept of a machine. You have no concept of um, local disk. You just have code that runs. Um, and because of that, there are a couple implications of that, one of which being that um, normal things you normally do, like, say, write to local disk or uh, talk to other machines, like via networking, don't work the way you'd want them to work because it's running in a kind of pool set of stuff and there is no concept of a machine. So when you do things like that, you have to use our APIs. Now in PHP, we've written those APIs directly into the calls you would normally do in the language. So like when you do file get put or file get content or file put content, that's all abstracted away. You don't really you don't normally run into it, but if you run on one of the other languages, there's varying degrees of integration because of licensing and all sorts of things. In return, we auto scale for you. So this means that if you're not running, if no, you have no requests, then we're running no boxes, no, no instances, what the base unit is called, and there's no charge. Um, if you get a giant load spike, we will handle that load spike for you and you will not perceive it. Um, we support Java, Python, PHP, and Go in this manner. Now, I'm going to, oh, I'll explain how this works. Basically, you have some code. You take that code and match it up with some configuration files, which is basically telling App Engine, like, 
use uh, use the PHP engine or use the Go engine or use the Java engine. Um, and then a couple other things like routing, like normally what you do in an HTC access file of pointing these URLs to these handlers. Um, you wrap that up and you just basically push it up. There's no there's no like FTP site or anything like that. You just say uh, use our command line tool and say deploy, and we take care of putting the code where it needs to go. Uh, you upload it and you get a URL, um, your app at appspot.com. You obviously can point uh, your own URLs to this. Um, and then uh, let's say you get some load, you get a little spike, and you need to run more instances of your code. We will spin up more instances of your code. You get a lot more load. We'll spin up a lot more instances of your, of your code. Now I want to show off how this works. Um, and uh, to do that, I'm going to break out of this. And let's see. Right. So um, I have a little app here. It's a visualizer. It's made of a couple. Ah. And it's still presenting. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. So I may not walk around so much. I may just stand here with my hand on the computer at all times. Um, so what are that? I've got uh, three layers to this app. I've got uh, some Compute Engine instances that I'm going to start up in a second. I've got an App Engine app. And I have Cloud Storage. Let me start up Compute Engine. Uh, let's see here. Okay, this is the right one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin up 10 instances of Compute Engine. And we're going to see them up here, up at the top. They're going to come in as they, as they spin online. And what they're going to do is they've got Apache Bench loaded on them. And Apache Bench is going to sh send a crap ton of load at App Engine. That App Engine URL is an app that does two things. One tells this thing, hey, I've been hit, and here's my unique uh, information. So you can see as we scale out, we can see all the nodes go up. And then it also writes to cloud storage so that I have a tangible, physical thing. Not, I guess really not tangible or physical, but you know, like I, I get an artifact from each request. So they're going to start spinning up, and the Compute Engine instances are going to start spinning up. Great. Um, and again, see how long that took. It took tens of seconds for those guys to load up. They all loaded up in about the same amount of time. And then here is my cloud storage bucket. I, you'll see that there's nothing, no objects already here. So uh, I'm going to fire up and send some load. Okay, and then we should be able to see the effect of sending load at at, at end. Enter. Okay. And it's going to take a second for the for the commands to reach the individual uh, compute engine instances. But once they do, you'll see they start firing up, and immediately my app engine app starts scaling out. Okay, and this is happening in real time. These are each individual nodes happening, and what ends up happening is for the amount of load because it's it's 10,000 uh, hits as fast as we can deliver it. There's a certain amount of throughput we're going to eventually hit where we've got enough machine, we've got enough instances to handle that. And you see, all these instances are still going up in the number of requests they're taking, right? So all total, they sent 10,000 requests. Compute Engine is sending them uh, across, and we should see that loading up. Now, if I go back to uh, my my storage bucket here, we'll see that all of these folders have been created. Each folder corresponds to an instance. And then in each instance, I have multiple files that uh, correspond to an individual request. So in that time, we loaded 10,000 requests, and uh, we handled it. So that's sort of a quick demo of how App Engine works. Whatever code I have, we'll just scale to take it. And when there's no load, it just the machines don't run. Okay. Me. And I'll go through and stop the Compute Engine instances I don't need. And we'll come back here. So App Engine pros, uh, no use, no charge, right? So if you have code that's not being hit, we don't, there's, it's absolutely free. Um, and we also have a free tier of usage. You get 20, 28 front, uh, 28 front end instance hours per day. 
So what that means is if you spin up exactly one instance and run it all 24 hours of the day, it's free because it's under 28 hours. If you spin up two and only run them for 12, it's still 24 hours, still under the 28 hours. If you spin up seven, that runs for five hours a piece. That's 35 hours, so you, you get charged for seven, right? So 28 minus, 35 minus 28. Yes? What constitutes a run? Because, like, uh, in, in my mind, like, you know, if you've got a system that comes up to run code and it's just sitting waiting, um, you know, it's, the web server is listening, that seems like it's running. No. Okay. No, basically, if, if, uh, if it's processing, if your code is being run. Okay. So if you're, the web, if, if the web uh, is listening, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, affect it. And if it's, you have an app that, like, I guess, um, say it has, like, a cron job that goes and, like, you know, takes care of some stuff periodically. That you, would, you would set that up uh, in a queuing system because you have to be careful. App engine requests have to finish in 60 seconds. We have a queue system that you get a longer lead time. But yes, when that process is running, you're eating up uh, your you're you're eating up your front end instance hour time. Um, but as soon as that system shuts down, it pulls itself down. Um, and then these spin down relatively quickly. They stay they stay up for a minimum of 15 minutes. The idea being that if you get a load spike, you might you might get another set of loads. So we're going to wait for a little while. But as as load drops off, these, these guys will start decay. Startup time, as you saw, was milliseconds, right? Like, as soon as you got the load, it went to it. Um, and we also have a quota to prevent fiscal disaster. What does this mean? So when I was uh, doing this demo, I got some of my zeros wrong. And so I ran the demo, tested it, and it worked fine the first time I ran it. And then the second time I ran it, it completely cracked. It, it, halfway through, it's completely crapped out. Started looking through the logs and saw 503 over quota. So looked back and did some math and looked at the logs and figured out that I, I thought I was sending like, you know, 20,000 requests. I was actually sending 16 million requests per time. And so what had happened was I sent 16 million through, it went fine. I sent the next 16 million through, and at some point in like around 8 million, uh, it was like, no, you're done with your quota. Um, and that quota is configurable, right? Like, so. It, Basically, it stops you from doing what I did, which is not understanding what I was doing and sending a whole lot of load at it, but also protects you, like, if, uh, let's say, I mean, it's possible as you're growing, they'd eventually hit a point where you're successful enough that the, the you're doing over the quota on a regular basis, that's great. You can raise that quota so that you can serve up the, the audience that you have. Um, some cons, some people are not happy with the language choices. Um, uh, the APIs, you have to do things through the APIs that you're used to doing directly. Um, and no third-party executables. So you've got PHP code, you've got Java code, you've got Go code. That, as long as it's code, we push it up, we compile it, it's fine. If you have, say, like C uh, extensions in, in PHP that you're running, um, you can't upload them, they will not run. Um, and that's just sort of the, the cost of, of doing it this way. Now. Some of, have anybody tried PHP on App Engine before? No. Okay. Uh, then this won't make entirely sense, but uh, there were some limitations previous um, if you had tried it. Right now we have PHP support that goes up to 5.5. Um, curl is now supported. Image Magic is now supported. And MongoDB are now supported. These are the three big ones that were really stopping it from being curl. I think was the one that was really stopping it from being um, useful without a little bit of pain. Now you can run curl. So pretty much most stuff that you run. The only sort of unique situation where you run into is when you need to generate stuff on the local file system. But you can, run, you can generate that stuff on the local file system in development and push it up, um, which most frameworks tend to allow. Um, and so that gets around that issue. All right, before I go forward, do you guys have any questions about App Engine? He's my colleague. He's just messing with me. It, uh, so Amazon has something called Elastic Beanstalk, which is similar, but it's not quite from, and I got to be very careful about making statements about competitive technology, but it's not quite as like you just push code up and it works. This is my understanding of it. I haven't played with it in a long time, but that was my take that like you have to do a little bit more 
upfront configuration and you have to worry a little bit more about the system even though there's no system. That That's my take on it. Your mileage may vary. So we don't, uh, this, ver this version of App Engine does not support Node. It supports those four languages that I talked about. Um, I guess if you can run Node on top of the JVM, that might be a way around it. That seems a little kludgy. Um, we do have a V2 uh, technology called Managed VMs that I'll talk about a little bit towards the end, which is the way App Engine is going to go. And we do have Node running on that. So not under this system, but under future future stuff we're doing, Node will be supported. So in the middle is Container Engine for people who want a middle option. You want some of the configuration ability of VMs, but some of the ease of running uh, of App Engine. So how many people are comfortable with containers? OK. All right. So I'll do a quick little interview. Like, if I'm going to explain something called Container Engine, i got to make sure you guys get containers and are cool with that. So you guys are all familiar with the matrix from hell, right? You've got um, Dev Laptop 1, Dev Laptop 2, QA environment stage and production. And maybe you're lucky in that your QA stage and production all look really similar. But um, your Dev Laptops are definitely not going to be the same. Um, and so you run into issues where, well, uh, on... Uh, Nginx on OSX uh, configuration files are here, but on Dev Laptop 2, they're somewhere else. And then that's not even getting into we're running different versions because version this of this breaks on uh, Windows 10. So we had to downplay a version. Like, you know, this sort of, you know, the problems that go along with this sort of configuration, right? So we solved that problem largely with VMs. Except VMs are kind of heavy, right? So on top of the hypervisor here, we're running individual machines with their own OS, with their own memory carved off, with their own processing carved off. And so a lot of things, like when they're being used efficiently, that's great. But a lot of times we're kind of wasting resources because when you allocate memory to a VM and it's not used, that VM, it's not like the host machine can take it back in most cases. So what I like in this too is so, Assume you have a laptop bag, and you start outgrowing your laptop uh, bag, and you decide, well, you know, instead of a more reasonable uh, solution to this, I'm just going to strap a handle onto an oil drum, put my stuff in the oil drum, and then carry that around. It works. It it technically gets all your stuff all the places, but it's big and bulky and sort of heavy. Containers fixes this by basically running a smaller footprint because everything is running on the same kernel. That limits you to running on Linux uh, kernel OSs. But in return, you get pretty good isolation of resources. You can fit more containers than you can of VM, VMs on the same hardware. And uh, these will spin up in a matter of milliseconds, usually, as opposed to the you know minutes you get for starting up your own OS. So the way you do this is through a Docker file. You create a, I'll start at the top. You want an image that has PHP Apache already built into it. This, there's some assumptions that they're already, they're, they're pulling from an Ubuntu image that is then pulling to uh, having PHP and Apache installed on it. And then I'm going to go a little bit further and install curl and PHP MySQL pair and a couple other things, um, put my own code on it and run it. That gets packaged into a Docker file. And then that Docker file um, can run all of these places, which turns my, pur uh, my matrix from hell maybe into a matrix from purgatory, right? So it's better. Um, so OK, so we're back at our continuum of computing. And we want something that runs between these two verses of uh, convenience and control. So Container Engine is a thing. It's containers as a service. Um, under the covers, it's running an open source project called Kubernetes. Um, and it goes with declarative configuration. What does that mean? So there's two concepts that are really important in, uh, in Kubernetes, which is one first one being cattle, not pets. Has anybody heard this metaphor before? OK. So cattle, not pets. Uh, has a name, uh, pet is unique or rare, personal attention, if it gets ill, you make it better. You think about this in the server side, like your server goes down in the middle of the night, you nurse it back to health, you've named it something like 
well, we're going to need 12 of these, so I'm going to name it Aries, because I can build out my zodiac signs, and it'll all be zodiac signs, and it'll be great. And we've all done that, right? But cattle, um, in, as in, in, in opposition, has a number, right? One is just like any other. If, if, if one doesn't serve your purposes, you grab another one. Uh, you run them as a group, right? You don't run them individually and, 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 and worry about each one in its place. And if one gets sick, you make hamburgers. Right. Now here's where I reveal that I don't know a lot about animal husbandry because if they get sick, I probably shouldn't eat them, right? Like that's, that's how mad cow happens, right? So we don't want to do that. Um, and the second concept that's really important with Kubernetes is desired state. So if we think about the normal way we do things, we run a command, we build some images, we launch the front end servers, we launch the, the service servers, and we launch our back end. Right? This is an overly simplified way of looking at it, but we, we go in steps and do these things. We run scripts. Um, if one of these machines were to blow up, I wait. I can wait for as long as I want, and uh, nothing's going to happen until a user or process intervenes. Now, with desired state, I just say, I want three front ends, two services, and one back end, and the system makes them happen. So if one of these machines were to blow up, I don't touch anything. Put my hand back on my laptop so it doesn't fall, and um, we're, uh, the machine just will start up back again. And what I liken this to is employees versus children, right? So you're working with a fellow employee, a coworker, or whatever, and you say, hey, you know, we had a tough day. You should go home and get sleep. That is the only instruction I need to give that employee, right? Like, they'll go home. They'll, they'll do all the middling steps it takes them to go to bed. On the other hand, if you have children, you have to tell them, go upstairs get undressed, put on pajamas, brush your teeth, pick out two stories, right? And any of you guys who aren't parents might be saying, do you really need to tell them to go upstairs? Yes, yes you do. Because if you don't, you'll have a naked child in your living room. And if they've been learning gymnastics, you will see things that you will never unsee, right? So tell them to go upstairs, right? And so this is the difference. I, with Kubernetes, and um, container engine, I say, give me five machines. With uh, an imperative build system, I have to say, build this machine, do it this way, then build this machine, do it this way. There's a slight difference in philosophy. So how this works out is, um, so I have a front end and services uh, container, right? And then I have a, a, a back end container that's my database, right? Now I have an environment. I need to scale it out. I scale it out a little bit, right? So I'm still working with just containers. This is a container engine. So I said, OK, um, someone talked to me and said, you know, having all your services and the front end together, we really want to split out HTTP, JavaScript, CSS from the services. Let's have that be different tiers and serve them differently so we can do different things with them. OK, so you split your two, uh, your, your one front end and services box into two containers, one front end that's just a, uh, just a web server and then a service layer. And so now your environment looks more like this. Right? And then someone points out that, you know, if this container, you know, you talk about, like, it's okay if containers just go away, they're ephemeral. If this container goes down, uh, I lose all my data. And uh, database storage and ephemeral really don't, that's not, like, th those are two things that should stay separate. So you say, okay, I need a persistent volume, so you add a volume, and now your environment looks more like this. So now you can scale out and say, I can serve more traffic, and I can, um, I can replicate my database, and that's great. Um, but then all of this is all running containers. This is all this sort of virtualized, like, happy land where, you know, everything just runs. Um, but the truth of it is that this is still running a machine that has resources, right? And eventually you're going to exhaust those resources. And the fact that all of this is running on one machine is bad, right? So you split it up into multiple machines. You have to set up networking to make both these, uh, all these containers talk to one another. Um, and then that doesn't even account for the fact that, like, okay, I've got multiple uh, container hosts, and one of them goes down, I now need to manually move everything over. So this is a lot to manage, right? Kubernetes and Container Engine, um, I basically throw a whole bunch of resources at it. I throw a whole bunch of config files for individual containers at it, and I say, give me four of these, three of these, two of these, and keep them running in perpetuity. And then Container Engine will take care of that. So I'm going to show a quick demo. Now, I've Julia child a lot of this stuff using Julia child as a verb. Basically, I have Docker images that I have to upload to repositories. All of that has been done. I've already set up a disk. So this is going to be the, the quick version of that. So first, because I like visualization, 
I have a, another visualizer here. This is for Kubernetes. Um, and again, I keep saying Kubernetes back and forth with uh, Container Engine. Container Engine is the Google Cloud Platform version of it. Kubernetes is the open source tool that we're running to do it. Um, and it's, you pretty much have access to Kubernetes at the Container Engine level because you can, you, all these commands I'm going to be doing are Container Engine command or Kubernetes commands. So I'm going to start services. And a whole bunch of stuff is going to happen. In theory, a whole bunch of stuff should happen. No? No, no, no. Have to refresh this. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, the connection got disconnected there. All right, so what do I have here? I've got the controller, which is going to make sure that I always have two of these running at all times. I have a service, which is my way of exposing this app. Right? And then down below, I have MySQL exposed as a service. That service is only going to be exposed in intra this container, so I don't expose MySQL to the world. And then I have my MySQL server. So if I want to pull out more MySQL servers, I can do that. If I want to spin up more front-end controllers, I can do that. And in fact, uh, I'm going to do that. Let me bump this up a little bit, bring it up. And I'm going to start running commands. So kubectl get pods. Okay, so these are all the machines that are running. You'll see that front end controller, um, I've got these little tags on it because they're cattle. I don't really care about them. The MySQL server is set up in a way that it's a little not cattle. I just did it for this demo to make it a little bit easier um, because I'm going to do most of the cool stuff with the front end, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kill one of the, one of the front end controllers. So I'm going to kill the first one, 43 IML. Uh, IML. So I'm going to say kubectl. Uh, stop pod running controller 43 IML. It's going to happen real fast. I'm going to hit enter and it's going to say, all right, it killed it. And you'll see one of them went yellow. That's not what happened. It killed the pod. Kubernetes determined that uh, a pod, sh I should have two and immediately started up a new one. That yellow was that a new one was starting up. So if I look at get pods, you'll see that we're back to two pods and uh, the names have changed. One of the names has changed because basically it will not let the environment change. It won't. I'm supposed to have two. It'll make me have two. Now, the next thing I can do is I can go through and say, you know what? Um, I want more than one. I want more than two. I, I, I have more load. I would like more than two running. So I can tell the front end controller to scale up. And you'll see I say uh, kubectl scale. Uh, Replication controller, front end controller, um, replicas four. So what's going to happen is it's going to say scale, and then two more pods are going to pop up. They're pending for a second, and now they're ready to go. So with this, I can, again, I'm not telling it spin up two boxes. I'm saying I want four boxes now instead of two boxes, and it just handles spinning them up. Now, how many people here have ever had to do a live update where you've got code that you need to update in production, and you're going to the new version? Right, you have you've built your own tools and stuff to do this based on other um, other sets of tools. Um, but it'd be really nice if I could just like tell Kubernetes to do a rolling update, right? Just roll an update a new version. So once again, I've Julia tiled a whole new image, whole new Docker containers that are set up. Oh, and my app, I haven't showed it here because um, otherwise it'll be confused. Um, I have a to-do app, uh, light background, pretty easy. Um, my designers have come through and told me that uh, light backgrounds are out. Uh, light, you know, light colored back, uh, light colored apps are out. We, it's all dark. It's got to be. It's got to be uh, everything dark. It's okay. So we've got a new version of the the, the code up. That's um, the dark version. I've got it already loaded up, ready to go. And so I'm going to tell Kubernetes to uh, let's see to do a rolling update. So you'll see that command, which is rolling update, front end controller, update period, and then a file. So basically, I'm telling it, replace the front end controller with a new front end controller called front end controller dark, and then spin up, uh, spin up new nodes. And what it's going to do is it's going to spin up a new node, wait till that node is, pen, is, is listening and active, and then spin down one of the old nodes. And it's going to do this until it gets to the right desired state, which is no front end controller, but front end controller dark running four versions of v2 instead of four versions of v1, right? So it's going to sit here and do that for a couple seconds. 
Now, I have the replication, I have the, the, the rolling update time set very low because I'm, I'm doing it in a demo, but you might want to have it take more than one second, you know, to catch errors and whatnot. And we get to the last one. Come on, there we go. And so now I should be able to go to my front end and see that my new front end, the code has been changed to the cooler, dark version. Um, and I did that pretty easily and with a lot, not a lot of pain. And eventually the old front end controller goes away and now I have a new front end controller. Now what's cool about that is that I did that completely independent of the service, right? Like I was serving up both versions of the app for a while. Um, and that's fine because it's a rolling update. Um, and I didn't have to change any of the service stuff. Um, it's still pointing to each one of those pods. So that is a quick demonstration of what containers and container engine can do for you. Any questions about that before I kind of sum up everything I've talked about? No? Okay. So, conclusions. We have a continuum computing app engine and a convenient side compute engine on the control side. And in between, container engine has some pieces of both, right? You, you basically craft very individual images of uh, OS and code. You then take those images, load them up, and then from the app engine side, we get basically, we'll run them for you. You want five copies running, we'll do that. We'll, ha we'll handle taking care of that. You need to go up, you need to go down, we'll handle that. In between, we also have some other technologies, managed VMs being one of them. Managed VMs are Docker files that are not part of Kubernetes and Container Engine. Um, they are part of App Engine. So they are, um, they're not full on App Engine where it's like zero to whatever scale. It's one to whatever scale. Um, so you always have one of them running. Um, but uh, you can customize it to be exactly what you want. So if you want Node.js, you can run Node.js. You want to run a different version of PHP or PHP with third-party code or Dart, if that's something you want to do, um, you can do that on app, uh, managed VMs. Um, and it'll be renamed, it, managed VM is not the name we're kind of going with, it's the name in beta right now. Um, we also have auto-scaling. So, Compute engine, you can set an image that this is, you know, and say, if this machine, the load gets over a certain amount, I would like you to spin up a new version of that machine. Um, and we can put load balancing on top of it and we'll handle that for you. Um, but again, you have to set it up. It's not sort of just right out of the box. You have it. You have to do some configuration stuff to make that work. Um, we also have Deployment Manager, which will like take whole systems of this and just put them out, um, including load balancing and auto scaling. You basically, again, you can figure it up ahead of time and then just put it out. There are things like preemptive VMs and click to deploy, which again blur the line between convenience and control in this whole space. So basically, wherever you need to go in terms of having full control versus uh, being as convenient as possible, we can sort of work out a solution for you in between. So hopefully your app is growing and you have lots of processing needs. Um, we can serve up those processing needs uh, with our various tools and technology. And we'd really hope that you consider Google Cloud Platform as a way of doing this. So I'm gonna break for questions. If you want to heckle me or get in touch with me, ask me questions, at TP Ryan is probably the best way on Twitter. Um, and this prezo is up at bit.ly slash TP Ryan dash PHP. So with that, I'll break for questions. If not, you guys are free to go your, your own ways. But any questions about any of the stuff we talked about? No? All right. Thank you. All right. Enjoy your next session. <laughs>